All right, guys. I think there's still a couple of people on their way, but we'll we'll get the ball rolling anyway. I don't intend to go for an hour and a half, but I just want to have a chat with you. There were some good questions about Australia Indian legal system, which we can kind of talk about now. In fact, there's a great book on the subject. I think there's one or two copies in the library that you can have a look at. So, Kirby helped launch it a couple of years ago. That's when he was last in India. But, um, oh, do I have it? Probably have it. Could pass it around and have a look. A bit of self promotion. <laughs> but, um, it's, there's actually not much literature on Australia-India relations, let alone legal sort of comparison. So that's why it's good that Kirby's coming across. Um, it'll be great to get a bit more literature out there, but this book that I put together a couple of years ago is try to put together different areas of law and compare the legal systems from all different perspectives. So for those of you who are doing a research paper, I think you're all doing a research paper, but those who are doing a comparative perspective, um, you might want to have a quick look through that the relevant chapter or chapters of that book. It might be a good starting point. There's a couple of um, available in, in the library. Um, otherwise, let me know. I think they're like 10 bucks each if you guys want to take one and bring it home with you as well. Um, so I thought before we talk about the legal system, I wanted to run through a couple of specific things about your program. I think Peter asked the question about it already, but you guys uh, have a different program to the other group. We will be traveling interstate next Monday, so a week from today. I'm still trying to figure out whether we'll stay in Delhi on Sunday night, but I'll let you know that shortly. So we're in Delhi anyway on the all day on Sunday, and I'm trying to organize accommodation in Delhi because we've got a very early flight the next morning, like 6.30 flight, so I'd rather be half an hour away from the airport than two and a half hours away from the airport for all of our sanity. So we can sleep on the plane anyway, but when we get to the other side, we're, we're basically, when we're in, um, we're going to Orissa, which is another state. You can ask RJ or others about that if you, if you want information, but it's basically east, probably, yeah, east of where we are here. It's eastern part of India. Um, and a really different part of India as well. But we're going there because Jin JSPL, Jindal Steel Power Limited, um, is the company where our benefactor and chancellor is, is from, um, Naveen Jindal, which you heard about in the context of the big flag over here. But they are hosting us. So we get to see a little bit about, a li little bit of the industrial belt of India, um, steel and power. And, and, and certainly the Murdoch guys who did this last year really enjoyed it. It's just a different perspective. And Orissa is kind of, the home to many of the more famous Hindu temples in India too. So we'll, we'll hopefully make it a bit of a cultural visit. Um, I'm liaising with people in the High Court in Orissa, which is in Katak, about an hour from the capital of Bhubaneswar. And, and there's also a possibility maybe of going to a wildlife sanctuary too. So there's a few options and that timetable is a bit dynamic. I'm hoping to jump on a call with the Jindal Steel people. Um, you can sit here if you want, Steve. Save the spot. But um, basically, you guys will have to bear with us a little bit in terms of that program, but I'll give you a bit more clarity closer to the time. Have a look online, um, but the climate is different there. It's warmer. So it's not going to be like summer in Perth or Melbourne, but it's going to be, it'll be a nice high 20s, I think, from when I spoke to them on Friday. So it'll be really comfortable weather for us there. So just dress accordingly or pack accordingly, I should say. And that brings me to an important point that Peter raised before, which is, you know, when we are traveling, how do we arrange that? You guys would probably take like a day bag, I think, rather than checking in luggage for two or three nights. It'd be better if you've got a backpack or, uh, you know, a wheelie bag. I don't know how you guys have packed. Some of you might not have, you know, little backpacks, but maybe just share a medium sized bag if you do. Ideally, in the interest of time, we don't want to be checking in luggage for such a short trip. Um, but once I give you a better idea of the itinerary, we should have clarity on what to pack. But as I said before, since we will be visiting a power plant and a steel plant, uh, closed shoes are really important because it's the type of thing where we go and wear a fluoro vest and a, a hard hat and they won't let us in without closed shoes as well. So um, I think the students enjoyed it last year, Steve. 
some good feedback. Some aspects of it are really popular. Mm. So we, it'll be a completely different part of India to where we were last year. So it'll be a different experience. We were in Chhattisgarh last year, which is another state altogether. So that's the kind of field trip. We, we have a couple of other trips that they don't have. Um, we have another Delhi trip on the 20th, I think. Let's have a look. Almost. I'm wrong program. Um, so I've gone through all the common trips with you guys already. But on day 24th, on day 17, we've got a big trip to Delhi as well, where we're going to the Supreme Court, all going to plan. We, these things might change. Uh, but, you know, that'll be really interesting experience. And we'll talk about the court systems in this lecture a little bit. But that's where we would make sure we need to dress a little bit smarter because that day we'll go to court. We'll cross the road to the Indian Law Institute, which we're going to on Thursday as well for Kirby's lecture and Justice Chandrachan's lecture. Um, then we're going to a big Indian law firm, my former employer, in fact, um, to talk to lawyers and, and how do lawyers work? What's a day in the life of a lawyer? I think we're talking to a competition law partner, we'll talk to a litigator and we'll talk to probably a corporate lawyer and a policy lawyer as well. All in, It's like a full service law firm, like a Clayton Utes or Freehills or whatever they're called now in Australia since I left. Mm -hmm. um, that type of firm. There's, there's no, and again this is something we'll talk on in the next hour, there's no foreign law firms in India. So this is kind of the best picture you will get about how big law firms operate in an Indian perspective. So those are a couple of the off-site things. Um, and exciting opportunities we'll look at and, and where they differ. I'm not going to go through the whole program seminar by seminar uh, because we've got a number of great guest lectures and a number of really good academics who will be addressing us on a whole host of issues. But mm. you guys can just look at the program. Um, we're even, in fact a bit more organized than we were last time and given you a course outline so you can actually give yourselves some context uh, about what the sessions will be about. And my advice would be maybe read one or two of the articles that are recommended to you to get a bit of context, if time permits as well. Yeah, question. Um, sorry, Sean. Um, when you visit the archivists, mm -hmm. uh, are we getting like a tour or something on the ground that time as well? Because it goes from like four to nine. Yeah, so I just got an email from them in the break. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll organise something. Oh, cool. Basically, interestingly, every Friday night, the bar is open at the Australian High Commission for Australians. So this coincides, yeah, so even I used to frequent, I not so much anymore because it's far away from here. But um, you, you'll, you'll often meet a, some really interesting Australian expats on Friday evenings at the bar. So this will coincide, we'll have a private sort of briefing, if you will, from diplomats and we'll walk over across the other side of the compound to the bar. Normally there is catering there, but this is the first Friday back at the Henry Lawson Club, they call it. Um, so I'm not sure if catering will be there. If it's not, we'll order pizza or butter chicken or something. So mm -hmm. we'll figure dinner will be available. That being said, actually, I should, thanks for prompting it, but um, we, drinks will, alcoholic drinks will be available, obviously drink responsibly, etc. But it's a cash bar, so you need to have Indian currency and there's no ATMs on the compound. It's just an important FYI. Mm -hmm. And maybe tell your... Um, Do they take power? No. But as Murti said, there are ATMs on campus. So um, we have a few. And actually, don't carry around too much cash in India, but it's a good idea to have a little bit of cash, particularly if we go to Delhi and you want to buy souvenirs and maybe there's a market and things like that. You know, you might need a few hundred rupees here or there. Probably a couple of thousand rupees couple maximum. Thousand. <laughs> I wouldn't, you wouldn't want to carry like hundreds of dollars with you I everywhere. Carry valuables in something else. Put a little bit of money in your wallet. I had two people try and pick my pockets last time I was here. If people come up and want photos, keep your hands jammed mm -hmm. tightly in your pockets. But keep a bit of money in your wallet and stash the rest in your shoe or something. It's really uncomfortable. You must have a lot of cash. <laughs> <laughs> it's just on a card. Not much anyway. But um, yeah, most places take card anyway. And, and for the most part, anything that's official in this program, you know, it's catered for and you can get through these three weeks, except maybe the free weekend if you're traveling without spending much money at all. Mm -hmm. um, all meals are accounted for on campus. 
uh, except if you go to the food court, which is you know on a paid basis. I don't. Was it open? It, it was last time. It was open. Yeah, it, yeah. It, there'll be three stores open this time. So um, you can, as I said, get your non-veg fix um, with a sub or a pizza or something like that whenever. There's also I didn't mention it before. There's a convenience store kind of on that side of the campus where you can buy, I mean, Maggie noodles and snacks and all sorts of you do toiletries, kind of whatever you need. That would have been there last time as well. The guy who runs it probably works at Murdoch. Really? That's just Rinda Khan. Oh yeah, they're related, yeah. yeah. There you go, I didn't know that bit of trivia. There you go. So the Murdoch people have something in common with the convenience store walla over here. Um, but are there any questions so far? Because that's, I don't want to dwell too much on the schedule, but I will touch on some of the modules that we're talking about when we're talking about Australia India legal system. Nothing yet? We've covered all the bases? Good, all right. Well, when you guys think as Australians, or we're not all Australians here, but as um, people who don't live in India, what, what do you think of when you think of the, well, let's start with India. Forget the Indian legal system. What comes to mind when you're thinking of India? Ajay, you don't need to answer this one. There's no wrong answers here. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? A lot of cash deals, handshake deals. Mm -hmm. It's a different one. Hmm. Don't say that to Mr. Modi. Oh, well. We'll talk about it. Yep. Um, like Oh, in the, the population so big and they're highly educated. There's more competition in school. Like, we don't really have to compete that many people to do well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whereas they have people with billions. No, it's like, is it really hard? You mean it's really hard to get to the top? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's true. It's actually more. Yeah. <coughs> Anything else? Culturally rich. Oh, no, you go. Yeah, um, culturally rich. Yeah. Great one. a good one anything else so we'll touch on some of these there's some really good points here how about the Indian legal system what do you guys think of when about the Indian legal system maybe there's some commonalities with the point you made but with the risk of being a difficulty understanding the concept of disclosure okay it's a very evidence-based <laughs> answer but true, probably. Any other points? I mean, you guys must know something, good or bad, about the Indian legal system. Quite similar to ours in the sense that it was established based upon the British system. Great. Unknown. Yep. It has a constitution, sort of like ours. Okay. Sort of like the US. Yeah. perspective I think but we'll talk about that do you mean for female criminals or generally <laughs> oh, okay say the executive isn't quite as rigorous as the Australian there's a bit of corruption and it's maybe not as maybe just not as acceptable for them. corruption access is probably a completely different issue mm -hmm. access to justice anything else this is all just whatever comes to mind. As I said, there's no wrong answers because nobody said really great food yet. Yeah, not under the law part. <coughs> oh, okay. I'll put food under the Indian part. <laughs> there is good food in the court, actually. Um, all right, well, let's use this as a starting point um, because actually it'll be interesting to hear how your answers change or if they change 
um, after three weeks because a, a lot of you have had very limited exposure to to India and in fact as Australians um, we're not really aware I mean we have a, an idea of stereotypes like curry and yoga and cricket for example but not really a strong understanding of, of India and how it functions and and it's interesting um, a lot of the perspectives we have um, for those who have had limited exposure to a country like India are often negative stereotypes because of what we've read in the news or because of, of what we've seen on TV. But um, a lot of the you know, economic advantages and opportunities that exist aren't necessarily there. For example, most of us wouldn't think that a career in law uh, would be feasible or indeed even something you'd want to look at with an Indian sort of slant to it. I would think anyway. I certainly eight years ago I didn't. I should probably I tell my story a little bit as well mm. to give you a bit of context. Um, I I think in two thousand and nine I received an Endeavour scholarship, not so different to NCP funding, so Australian government funding, to go to an Asian trading partner. Uh, and at that time there were twenty of us in Australia. I think about sixteen went to China or Hong Kong, a couple to Singapore, one to Indonesia, and one here to India. So I came here um, being a law student. I thought, one, you know, economically and from a business sense, India is a big growing superpower and, you know, there's a lot of potential there. It's kind of unexplored. Whereas on the flip side, from an Australian perspective, we have a lot of links with China. You know, 16 of the 20 people are going to China or Hong mm. Kong. It's kind of, we're exploring or have explored those synergies whereas I thought India not necessarily and certainly from a legal perspective what similarities do we have with India that we don't have with China if you think about it which make working in the legal space easier or transitioning easier mm. you have the English language now I think that's not something to be underestimated the language of the law in India is English now there's a lot of advantages to this because it means there's a common language of the law nationally now there's so many official i think 17 official languages in india and many more dialects so that presents problems but of course advantages as well the problems are access to justice if the language of the law is english and you speak hindi and you're illiterate in the english language uh, not only do you not have access to to good lawyers potentially but you probably cannot understand the laws that govern where you are but anyway, English language makes comparing the legal systems much easier uh, and certainly legal research and legal practice. Of course, the similar systems of government. We both have federal systems of government. Um, the, uh, Professor Murti spoke about the, the large and free press that India has. And certainly you would say in Australia as well, which is an interesting comparison. And again, I'm not necessarily contrasting with China, but some of these do not exist in China. Um, then you've got the largest democracy in the world. The EU is the second largest election in the world after the Indian General Assembly election. So that puts it into perspective a little bit. It's a huge democracy with separation of powers. They have a constitution, indeed, a newer constitution than ours with certain provisions of their constitution um, inspired, if you will, by our constitution or part of British legislation, of course. So. Um, you're right when you say this British legacy or the colonial kind of footprint uh, has helped shape both of our legal systems. There's no doubt about that. And as a consequence, you have acts of parliament, you have um, the constitutions, the systems of government are, are quite similar. So I guess the economic and professional opportunities coupled with the similarities sort of drove me to India. Subsequently, I've worked, I studied actually in the National Law School of India for a bit, which is down in Bangalore. I worked in a sports law firm. I now sort of dabble in sports law practice and teach sports law here in India. And I was at UQ actually, I was telling Steve a few weeks ago, teaching into their sports law course as well. Um, but I digress. Uh, after the sports law stint, I worked, I did a quick stint in, in Oxford for the BCL, but I worked in, after that, at Amachan Mangaldas, which is now Shardal Amachan Mangaldas, which we are going to. So, uh, top tier law firm, full service law firm, and we went there last year mm. as well. Um, I did that for three and a half years, I think, and then worked in the IPL, which is the Indian Premier League, the Cricket League, um, working on operations and some of the legal stuff there, 
before joining here about one and a half years ago. So uh, apart from the legal journey, I've, I've had some pretty strong links with the Australia-India relationship. I started the Australia-India Youth Dialogue. Don't know if you've heard of that, uh, which is about to hold its seventh instalment in next week or the week after. Um, and now, of course, this Centre for India-Australia Studies, just all trying to bridge this gap between Australia and India because it's, it really is an unexplored or underexplored relationship, mm. which we'll come back to as a theme throughout this um, lecture. But it's also something Michael Kirby said in 1996 when he was addressing a big group of people. And that's why I think in many ways this has come full circle because I'm sure he'll tell us this again later this week where both systems just don't know enough about each other really. Uh, we have so many similarities Yet because of our different socioeconomic and cultural sort of backgrounds and our scale and size and population, there are really interesting points of comparison where we can kind of learn from each other. So um, a comparative approach of these two legal systems is actually really interesting. And I would encourage you in your research papers to think about um, maybe comparing the area of law that you're interested in to the Australian side of things. I know a lot of the Murdoch students did this last year. <laughs> mm. And it's actually something you could probably reuse, either publish it or reuse it back in, in Oz in a course there because it's a really interesting comparison and, and something you can use in practice and certainly in academia. And we use it a lot, comparative laws used a lot more in academia than perhaps practice, but... Unless it's where you practice. Unless it's where you practice. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly sports law, we use a lot of things from a lot of different jurisdictions, for example. So, Can I just put yeah. a, a sideways perspective on yeah, this? Please. Sean talks about getting funding to come here in 2009. Uh, about that time, 2008 to 2009, Murdoch was looking at expanding international relationships, and there was a big discussion within the law school about India and uh, China. And I think it was the lone voice pushing for India. Everyone else said China. And one of the things that came up, and I remember it so well, um, those of you who come from my university know Guy, said India would be terrible, it's too corrupt. And I had to say, you mean not like China where everything is honest and above board. <laughs> At any rate, the push was into China and I think it was um, far less than successful because in order to attract Chinese students, you've got to deal with the fact that most of them have been educated in another language in a law degree that has very little relevance to our own. While if you're looking at the size, if, you, if you're really going to be blunt about it, the size of the market, um, here you have a whole bunch of people who are educated in the same language in a system that, despite being different in many ways, is very much a clone of our own. Um, Sean has been telling me about some programs they have now where their students can start uh, in, did you say their fourth year, to, to do a year in Australia where they will end up getting qualified in India and Australia because the OP Jindal degree is now recognised in Australia. Um, and I really wish the law schools had listened to me all those years ago because we'd be much further down what I see as a very desirable path. Um, just a statistic from last year when I was here, and I may have the numbers completely wrong, but I remember someone saying that in a few years, India is going to be short about 20 million university places. Um, that's a pretty mind-boggling concept for us. Um, I think, I don't know where all your friends are, but probably you made the smartest choice. Well, let's see. I mean, time will tell, and we're going to have a fantastic lecture from on a where not actually. So I'll I'll talk about the education. So it will be in um, Ambassador Amit Gupta, who spoke oh, to good, us good. last year. Um, we'll be speaking to the others when we're in Orissa. But he gave a he was the Consul General of Sydney when that the so-called student crisis happened um, in Australia, where some Indian students were. They won't even remember it. Yeah, you guys won't remember it. Where. Uh, allegedly targeted and and that sort of put a dampener on on the relationship the uh, the bilateral relationship because the media really did hype it up here and it arguably was not managed very well um in an australian context but um you know education is an interesting parallel that i could talk about for a whole one and a half hours it's a really important part of the australia india bilateral relationship and that just last year alone i think there were sixty thousand indian students in australia uh, so it's a huge economic advantage, but also intellectual um, tie between the two countries. Because mm -hmm. if you think about it, you'll hear the term in some of our lectures throughout the next few weeks, soft power and public diplomacy. That Indian diaspora, which now has about 
700,000 people who identify as, as Indians in Australia, um, mostly in, in Sydney and Melbourne, but Perth, I think, has a, a large and growing population too. That they're actually a really important part of the bilateral relationship because, because they have friends and family here. They might come back here as an alumni and build on the knowledge and awareness of opportunities Australia has to offer. Incidentally, I alluded to the fact that the re education relationship is growing. Part of that has got to do with the current context in the world. Can anyone think of why students, Indian students, might want to study in Australia now more than ever? It's got nothing to do with Australia, perhaps. Or the weather. <laughs> Both of which are great. Because there's not enough universities in India? That's... that's well, that's probably okay. factually not Fine, but why would they go to Australia rather than another country? Why would you pick Australia if you're an Indian student? Uh, um, perhaps the fact that there's a situation in America as well. Very diplomatically put. I would say that's right. Because the States is run by a nutbag? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're on camera, Steve. Um, <laughs> I don't think I'm big enough fish for him to fry. He doesn't watch TV. It's <laughs> okay. um, so it, it's anecdotally, uh, it's quite true. And not anecdotally, the numbers in Australia are showing there's been a massive increase in Indian students enrolling or applying for degrees since Trump was elected into India and since Brexit happened in the UK and visa things was, were strengthened in, from a UK perspective. So Australia is actually in a really unique um, situation in this point of time to capitalise on that. So again, I digress from the legal system, but education is such an important part and it's such an interesting time in the relationship. And our degree is now recognised in India. It's a yeah, two-way street, isn't by it? the Bar Council of India. Mm. So um, let's, let's move back to the law. I think we touched on the fact that we have um, federal constitutions, we have independent judiciary, separation of power, English, um, similar systems of government, similar federal systems with respect to the court system. So we have the High Court as our peak court, here it's the Supreme Court, but other than the name changes, we have a very similar system in terms of appealing decisions and original jurisdictions um, of the different courts as well. What are the differences? Heaps of differences, despite those similarities. I think one of the biggest one is the scale and size of the population in an Indian context, but also, as you guys alluded to, the diversity in this country. So to put it into perspective, if Uttar Pradesh, does anyone know what Uttar Pradesh is? What is it? So it's the state which we'll go to in, in a few days actually, where the Taj Mahal is, where Agra is. It's a, it's a huge state in India. It's a bordering state to us here. It's like we could drive there in about an hour from here. If Uttar Pradesh was a country, it would probably be the fourth or fifth biggest country in the world by population. Now put that into perspective, right? Um, it's, uh, India already is almost 1.3 billion people now. Australia's 24, 5? Mm. I lose track. The point is the population of Delhi, NCR, is bigger than that of the whole of Australia in one city. So managing the amount of people you know, that the court system has to deal with, that the legal system has to deal with, is just it really is like comparing apples and oranges. Um, and you will see when we go to court, whether it's here or Orissa, the, there's just lawyers everywhere and they're running from courtroom to courtroom. There's thousands of lawyers um, and they might be dealing with seven or eight cases in one day, sometimes appearing and then literally running to another courtroom. I remember Steve and the other students were, were quite surprised and overwhelmed by the scale and the number of people involved. Um, RJ, I don't know if you've had exposure to the legal system here and there, but I find it quite a contrast, at least from that perspective. Um, it was amazing. So, mm -hmm. there you go. So th that's something really interesting. Yeah. And I got like, you know, that in, in, in Australia, mostly lawyers do only lawyers' job. Here, because so many people are not, they are totally unaware about the legal system. And there are some who are uneducated. They hire the lawyers for their, you know, just normal, Documents filling or other like you know that um, land matters which are not directly related to the law. So as lawyers here are very busy. 
Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very different culture. And, and you you might find it quite similar when we go to a top tier law firm, the, the terms of the business of law and the professionalism of all. But as RJ said, basically, you have lawyers or advocates who are a jack of all trades. They kind of handle all different types of matters. They're advocates in lower courts or even high courts. Um, but another aspect, apart from the scale, or maybe as a result of the scale and population, is the length of time that court cases take. And you guys may have heard of, of um, the long and drawn out processes here. You may have, for example, land disputes, disputes over property, um, that might go on for generations. So you might start a case that your grandchildren might eventually hear the end of. Um, and it's not only for land disputes, it's India is notoriously slow for its litigation and enforcing its contracts and judgments. So uh, that's certainly a big difference. And it's something India is, Indian legal system is starting to try and change the culture of, but that culture needs to change from the lawyer's perspective and the judge's perspective and the executive, the lawmakers. So in Australia, we had a huge transition and drive to make this happen in the judiciary. We had Justice Spiegelman, we had uh, lawmakers, we had lawyers all pushing for change to have justice served. And justice was not just the substantively the right decision, it was a quick and speedy and cost-effective situation. That's why we've had a huge increase in alternative dispute resolution in Australia to, to achieve justice, which is both procedural and substantive justice, if I can call it that. But here, there might be a push for the correct decision, but it's not always just if you've got people seeking uh, prosecution of a criminal or trying to seek an injunction or an outcome of a commercial transaction. And if that takes 10 years, and they finally get the result, they've wasted 10 years of a commercial opportunity which might be futile in the end, for example. So you've got to put that into perspective and it, um, it is something that the Indian legal system is criticised about often and one of the reasons, in fact, that India is ranked currently 100 on the ease of doing business list in the world because of its, its slow kind of um, legal resolution or dispute resolution mechanisms. Um, why is that the case? There are a number of reasons why, and, and maybe the scale is part of it, but also the culture is a huge part of it. Uh, a big percentage of transactions that are pending are against or for the government, and many argue that the smaller ones should be settled because they're spending more money fighting these disputes than they're actually worth in some cases. But also you'll, you'll hear anecdotally, or you might even see, when a judge in the Supreme Court or High Court has 60 cases listed before it in a single day, it follows that most of those cases will either be adjourned to another day, thereby exacerbating the problem, or uh, you summer, like they might be dismissed quickly. Uh, it could be a mix, but if a barrister comes before or the junior of a barrister comes before a judge with 60 cases in front of it and says, look, my senior advocate is teaching at this university or he's sick or he's traveling. Can we adjourn for another month? Often, unfortunately, the judge is, is not reluctant to refuse. He'll say, yes, next. That just delays justice even more. So that's an unfortunate fact of dispute resolution and I think Gaurav and Mehta agree that they're, they're snickering in the back, but it, it is something that happens in an Indian context. Um, access to justice is also a, a huge issue. We talked about language, but of course, when you've got um, 1.3 billion people, and there are millions of lawyers in India, um, and there are, I think, hundreds of thousands probably of law graduates that graduate each year. So there are lawyers but still accessing good quality legal advice is a huge problem here. Not only because quality outside of the cities is hard potentially to come by, but cost. A big, we, uh, one of you mentioned disparity as, as an observation about India. Uh, many people can't afford access to justice and you'll find actually, speaking about criminal law, there might very well be people, and there are people in prison who just simply cannot afford someone to defend them and therefore they just stay in prison for 20 years until maybe they're acquitted or they just stay in prison anyway um, for the rest of their life. 
despite being innocent. So criminal law is actually a huge problem, not only for those people who um, accuse people of crimes, but sometimes for people who are accused. Very often they do not get the, um, the legal advice and protection that they need as well. So I, I might be painting a very negative picture here, but I'm sort of glossing over some of the issues that you'll come across. Now, there's some, I'll talk about corruption, I'll park that, because I don't want to stick with all the negative stuff, but India is such a vibrant constitution, and maybe Michael Gove will talk about this, but um, how many referendums have we had in Australia that were successful? How many times has Australia changed its constitution? Does anyone know? Some of you are very quick to type it in Google. Yeah, it's eight. Eight. Eight all up or eight changes? Eight changes, eight successful referendums. In how many years since our constitution came about? Yep. Medha Gaurav, how many times has India's constitution been amended? A little over a hundred. Um, that's not necessary, and it's in, in half the time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's a much younger constitution. That's interesting, not because um, the constitution was so rubbish that they had to change it completely. It's largely because it's easier to change the constitution in India. You don't have to have a referendum for every single change. In fact, you can have um, a certain majority in parliament uh, to make certain changes to it. There are certain parts of the constitution, structural changes, um, that do need or mu are much more difficult to change. But these are questions and issues that you'll talk about when uh, Professor Kagesh Gautam teaches you about constitutional law. I think, do we have that tomorrow or next week? Whenever it is. So um, there's some interesting, this is why I say there's some really interesting areas of comparison. There are clauses or heads in our constitution like trade and commerce where India has borrowed certain parts of that. And you will see Indian Australian case law referred to in Indian Supreme Court cases. In fact, um, we had a recent conference with UNSW professors where an analysis was done between how many times has, have Australian, has the Australian High Court referred to Indian cases and vice versa. Uh, for, I should mention there's about 60,000 plus cases in the Indian Supreme Court every year. So that's huge mm. compared to Australia. In the history of Indian Supreme Court decisions, there's been about 444 Australian cases referred to. When I say about, I probably mean exactly, because it's a strange number to say about for. Um, in Australia, there's been 39 references to Indian cases, so far fewer. Um, and what's really interesting, I'll talk about this when I when we talk when Kirby's here, but these the references to Indian decisions happened at about the time, sort of in the 90s, for whatever reason, maybe 80s, whenever Kirby was was sitting. 65% of those cases that refer to Indian decisions were Michael Kirby's judgments. Um, so there's been a real reluctance in the Australian judiciary to. A, refer to foreign judgments more generally, I think, in, in our High Court. Um, but B, to, to look to India. Uh, and that might be in part due to the ignorance about the Indian legal system because there's some really fantastic judgments that have been passed down here and some really great jurisprudence which, which you'll hear about. Um, and that's why these courses are so fantastic and why learning about law from a comparative perspective, whether it's India or any other country, is actually really useful because... It can be used in a domestic context, and Kirby gets it, but I, perhaps many other judges are, are a bit more insular in the way they look at um, the law. But that's a completely different constitutional debate altogether, which, which you won't get bogged down in. Uh, you guys have lectures on law and society this week and next week, you, which will, you'll talk about, I think, things like caste and religion, which was mentioned earlier here. Um, you might talk about corruption and how that impacts not only the executive, but how that impacts day-to-day -day life in a country like India. We have corruption in Australia. We have, there's cor corruption everywhere in the world, but India was recently ranked one, I think, in Asia by Transparency International on the corruption list. So corruption's still a huge problem here, and the current Prime Minister 
is um, part of his mandate, I should say, is to, to reduce corruption. Uh, and I think there is a general cultural push towards that, but it's, it really is quite deeply entrenched. Uh, and because of the bureaucracy and the, the difficulty people have to push through things, whether it's filing, you know, mm. uh, your property certificate to get your, your house registered or whether it's getting a driver's license because it's really bureaucratic and difficult. Um, your everyday person will often pay a bribe, uh, which just feeds into the kind of corruption cycle. But these are kind of issues that, that will come up. And, and again, it's really important not to only look at it through a negative lens. Obviously, corruption, please look at it through a negative lens. But the, the Indian legal system, does lead the way in many respects and and you will see some of the best and brightest lawyers um, come out of India that one of the ICJ judges has just been appointed from India for example um, you have UN special rapporteurs from India on a regular basis one of the more recent ones was UN special rapporteur for health um, who is based in Delhi a former he, he finished up a few years ago and you'll see this when we go to Amachan Mangaldas, Shadal Amachan Mangaldas. Difficult to say, you can call it Sam, because that's what everyone calls it. Um, some of the best lawyers in the world. And indeed, when you're doing law as an Australian lawyer, you will come across Indian lawyers. Um, I, when I was working at Sam, uh, worked across the tables from Australian lawyers, because nowadays, wherever you work, if you are a corporate lawyer, if you're in-house, you will work on international transactions. So actually understanding the context of where other lawyers come from is really useful. So think of questions you might want to ask these guys in a couple of weeks when we go and see them. Um, but understanding how they work and how they think is, is really useful. Um, the hours they work are different, sure. The business of law and the way they do uh, transactions inside their offices might be a bit different, but when you're sitting across the desk from a lawyer negotiating a contract, it doesn't kind of matter um, where they're from, apart from the fact that it's useful to understand the cultural nuances from a negotiation perspective as well. So all of these things come back, and you can see I'm jumping around a little bit because there's just so much ground to cover in this in the context of Australia-India comparative law. Um, do I have any questions thus far? Because I've jumped on a lot of topics. Yes, Steve. I do. In a firm like that, mm -hmm. what's the charge out right for a reasonably senior lawyer? Can you put that cost into Australian dollars for me? Yeah, it's it sometimes varies between a domestic and international client mm -hmm. um, across firms, but it might be five hundred dollars for a partner, mm -hmm. which is probably half the price yeah. of an Australian thing. So there actually is a cost advantage, and it's it's relatively unexplored. But I'm talking about the business of law now. Um, to do transactions in India um, if you find quality lawyers to do it because it's it's a fraction of the price and that's that's a top partner in a top, top firm. firm so often um, the charge out rates for lawyers are cheaper however interestingly senior advocates they call them here which is like a QC or an SC probably earn more not just kind of on a um, pro rata basis or comparative basis, but probably actually earn more than our SCs or silks in Australia. Mm. Um, and therefore the purchasing power of, of what they earn is just incredible. Yeah. So the best lawyers in India do incredibly well um, and charge out exorbitant amounts. They might charge $10,000 for a, a five minute appearance in court, for example. It's just, it's exorbitant. So access to that is obviously, you know, most people don't even think of, but the big corporations certainly would employ a senior advocate because judges will shut up and listen to them when they when they talk, basically. Um, so again, we're we're jumping around the place, but we've got a bit of a perspective on on Indian courts and how they operate. Despite having similar procedures and similar structures, they have very different challenges to what we have in Australia, mostly due to the size and perhaps the culture and timeliness of the system. Uh, we've also talked about corruption and how that impacts um, governance and day-to-day -day life. Um, and, you know, there's, we haven't actually talked about certain discrete areas of law, but you will have a seminar on intellectual property. This is one area, interestingly, that 
is largely based on the British system, although we have had more reforms in an Australian context. Um, and also driven, of course, a lot of these things are driven by international treaties. In, in IP's case, it's TRIPS. But uh, if an international treaty is involved, of course, there is going to be harmonisation and commonalities across areas of law. So it's another area where we can, where comparative law is sort of advantageous. I'm just looking at your schedule and trying to touch on some of the topics you'll come across. This week is actually quite a mixed week uh, because you're looking at a lot of non-law stuff as well and getting a platform of, of the Indian economy, Indian society and culture and things like that. Has anyone here, by the way, studied competition law yet? A couple of you, because you've, you've got a, a brief competition law seminar. How about IP law? You've studied all of them. Um, so... It's, it's really important that, I mean, I will try and brief your uh, professors or academics before they teach you, but um, if stuff's going over your head because you haven't studied a subject, just tell them and ask them to rewind and give you the basics of IP law or competition law and stuff because it's actually not just a good opportunity for you guys to get a sense of Indian law, but to understand what in effect are common law principles in, in many cases or comparative law concepts that you can come up back home at your degrees as well. So um, if something's going over your head, I'll brief everyone just to make sure they gauge the level of knowledge in the room already. But it's kind of the onus is on you guys just to put your hand up and say, can you please explain that a little bit better? Um, corporate law, there's quite a few of you who are doing um, double degrees with, with commerce or BBAs and things like that. And even still, if you're not, many are considering work, I think, in a corporate firm. There's a few lectures on um, corporate law that are coming up here. Uh, Arjo Majundar is a, is a really good professor here. He'll teach you things like how, to, how one <laughs> sets up a company in India, what is corporate law. There's been huge reforms in India um, in corporate governance since 2013. There was a new act, basically, a, a complete reform of the company law that happened. So um, I, that's about the time that I started at, at, at the law firm, actually, here in Delhi, at Amachand. Um, so in many respects, I was at a position of all existing corporate lawyers because everyone had to learn the new act. It was like starting again for many of them. So um, India, for, for all the... Uh, disadvantages and challenges that I've mentioned from a legal system, it, it, it's, there are a lot of really interesting reforms and changes that have perhaps had to happen and that have um, really shown India to take the initiative in many respects in their legal system. So the reform of company law in 2013 was an interesting example. Um, and there's some interesting nuances in this and Arya will get into this when you're lectured on it, but compulsory CSR contributions, for example, where firms now have to give up to 2% of their revenues to charities, basically, or NGOs. Uh, so basically forced uh, mandatory donations or setting up projects that will benefit the community or education and things like that, which is not a concept we have in Australia. We have corporate governance um, thresholds and in fact, disclosures on things like this for, for listed companies, but there's certainly no mandatory um, giving away of, of company profits or revenue. So this is some in, an interesting difference that might be worth considering in that seminar in particular. There's a whole separate seminar on that taught by Arnab Bos, who's another um, assistant professor here in the, in the law school. You, it, I think the program's shaped out really good. There's about four different deans and or vice deans addressing you on different issues um, and you can just read that to see. We had a couple of them last year as well. Um, but there's also sort of woven throughout this um, program non-legal stuff. So there's a, a topic on 23rd about the education system in India. There's a topic on social entrepreneurship in India. So it's kind of to give you a taste of, of India. I mean, this the title of the immersion program, right, is... Um, not what it is on the screen, but it is, it's about business, law, and society. 
I think that's the one for, for one of the other unis. But the point is, um, it, we want you after three weeks to get a real sense of, of India. Um, it's becoming a, a, a global superpower in many respects and it's expected to be um, the third biggest economy, I think, in the next 10 years or 15 years. Um, and, you know, there's no escaping that from an Australian perspective. India is a really significant trading partner for Australia. And um, I suppose I've got a bit more time. I can, I can give a bit more context about India in the context of Australia's relationship with India. India is really significant for us. Apart from, um, well, it's, it's about a $16 billion trading partnership now. It was $19 billion a couple of years ago. I'm not aware of this last year's statistics. Um, but to put that into perspective, India's trade uh, partnership with China is about $70 billion, and it's about $63 billion with the US. So from India's perspective, Australia is not, you know, front and center of things economically. Although from Australia's perspective, India is pretty important economically. It means a lot from us in terms of services revenue and education, energy and resources. You guys must know about the controversial things that are happening in Queensland with the Dani and things like that. Um, you know, there's economic and environmental arguments on these things. But from an economic perspective, there's billions of dollars in the context of that relationship. There's also KiCA, Closer Economic Cooperation Agreement, I think it stands for, which is a free trade agreement, negotiation, which has been going on for about three years now, and it's sort of hit a bit of a wall, um, but it's something that's going on in the background in terms of the relationship. Interestingly, uh, the bilateral investment treaty um, between Australia and India was cancelled, I think, last year. Um, so we had a BIT and if you are interested in that part of law and, and you know investment treaties and things like that, it's, it's worth looking into because India's kind of reformed or uh, cancelled out most of its bilateral investment treaties in recent times. And Australia had one of the landmark cases um, where an Australian company basically challenged the Indian government under a bilateral investment treaty before an international arbitral tribunal and won because basically... Um, the court process was, was taking too long and their rights were not being enforced as per their rights under the bilateral investment treaty. So they succeeded against the Indian government. I'm not sure if they ever enforced that award because despite being a member of the New York Convention, one still has to enforce your, you know, your money order or whatever amount you're owed in the country where the, the debts are. So... Um, it's BITs are a really interesting part of the investment framework and India has really made some sweeping reforms in that space. But moving back to the Australia-India relationship, there's a lot of Australian companies that are showing interest in India, but it's still a fraction of our relationship with China. I think it's about, oh, China's about <coughs> seven or eight times bigger in terms of that trade dollar bucket with India. And as a consequence, particularly in education, but also in, in many other industries, um, Australian companies are very comfortable with China. And I think, I mean, that's great and we've got a great relationship, but it's also risky because if something happens to the Chinese economy or if things change domestically, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an argument to be made for diversity in terms of Australian companies thinking. And you'll, you'll get a sense of this over the next few weeks and, and certainly on Friday when we speak to the Australian High Commission as well. Um, economic piece of the puzzle is only one, one part of it. In fact, have you, have you guys heard of the three C's of the Australia-India relationship? It used to be characterised by the three C's. I think we've got to wrap up shortly. Um, maybe half an hour. But the three C's were cricket, commonwealth and curry which people in Australia thought of when they thought of the Australia-India relationship. And we might chuckle at it now, but it's been characterised stereotypically like that for a while. Ambassador Dasgupta, who spoke to us last year, said we should move away from these three C stereotype to the three E's. Economy, education, and something else. <laughs> what would the something else be? I've alluded to it already. In Queensland. 
No, which probably should be. Energy. Um, resources. Resources are a big part of our economic relationship. So the three E's are perhaps a more relevant acronym than the three C's nowadays. It does miss a big part of where the relationship is heading, however. Anyone, apart from the economy, can anyone think why India is really important to Australia and vice versa at the moment? And this will become relevant in some of your lectures. True. So there might be a comparative advantage. However, from a manufacturing perspective, we, we would probably go to other countries. Uh, incidentally, India's much more services based economy mm. rather than mm. kind of manufacturing. But even apart from all this commercial and economic side of things, why would India be important to Australia and vice versa? Yeah. Defense. Yeah. And so, did anyone see this um, foreign policy white paper that came out a couple of months ago in Australia or hear about it? So we released a foreign policy white paper, which basically um, Julie Bishop and, and her team sent to the world, this is our position on foreign policy in Australia. Um, and the reason that was important, it basically said, there was a chapter there that said, China is really important to us economically, um, but we need to be wary of it strategically from a defense perspective, basically. Mm. It also said... India is important to us both economically and from a strategic perspective. And there are lectures and topics coming up about India and the South China Sea. Um, you guys must have heard about what's going on or what has been going on in the South China Sea. And, and generally, Australia is renowned for its strong naval presence in the Indian Ocean. So instead of this idea of the Asia Pacific that we've historically heard about, Australia has pushed successfully in the last decade or so towards this concept of the Indo-Pacific. And Australia is very much part of the Indo-Pacific, but India is central to the Indo-Pacific. So India is playing a really important strategic role in the region. When I say strategic, I mean not looking at it from an economic perspective, but from a defence perspective, as you put it, sec national security. And we could talk again for hours on the region and India's national security, but the fact of the matter is India has a very strong presence from a defence and military perspective. In fact, we're hearing from a former Lieutenant General tomorrow during one of our lectures as well. But this is really important to keep in mind when we're learning about India and learning about the Australia-India relationship because it really is the future of of our region, I guess. And Australia is quite isolated. We're an island in the middle of the, in the ocean. We're, you know, we're close to certain smaller countries, but as far as the big countries go, India and China are not that far off and they're both gonna be big economic and strategic superpowers, arguably, in future decades, certainly when we all grow up. So it's really great that you're here to be educated about what India is shaping up to be in that sense. So there are a lot of positives from that aspect, but there are a lot of challenges. I won't say negatives, but challenges that India has to grapple with from a legal system perspective and generally from a socioeconomic and economic growth perspective that Australia doesn't necessarily have to grapple with, at least at the same scale. So when we're looking at what we're learning over the next three weeks, we kind of have to keep putting everything into perspective that, right, this might not be the way we do things in Australia, but I can understand why it's done differently in India. It has to be done differently, for example. So uh, that's kind of a really important cultural lens thing to think about over the next few weeks. Try not to look at everything through your Australian lens, but try and understand why things are the way they are here. And um, these are the types of things that you should kind of nut out in your reflective journals as well in terms of your learnings. How are we going now? Any any questions until now? Uh, yeah. What's the general feeling about like in just the general population of India with the links <coughs> to Australia? Like, do the general people like it or? In what sense? Like, um, so obviously there's a lot of links between like the Indian, the higher stuff in India law, but I mean, does the general population even know about it or? In Australia. In, in India about Australia yeah um, well I, th I think it goes both ways I think Australians 
if I understand your question correctly, Australians are quite ignorant mm. of India. And I think the same is true the other mm. way around. We've, we've pushed on campus and through the center and otherwise really aggressively on creating awareness about opportunities in Australia and about Australia generally. Because, and RJ may or may not agree, but historically, um, affluent families and, and, and as, aspiring Indians who are, who are looking to work abroad or study abroad would not look to Australia. Yep. It would be a third choice, fourth choice perhaps. But it would be US and UK would be front and centre. But I, as I said, I think that's really changing and I mm. think we're really seeing that. So Australia's uniquely placed at the moment in that sense. Um, and as a result, while Australia might not have been on people's radars previously, it certainly is increasingly there. Um, and from a soft power perspective, look, uh, Australia is lucky that we have cricket with India. I mean, we, we, we don't need to hide behind that. People know about Australia because of cricket in some respects. I will get into a rickshaw, an auto rickshaw still today. And, and you know, someone will say, where are you from? I'll say Australia. They'll say Ricky Ponting. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have a, a great exchange of names about cricketers. So that soft power or that connect is something that money can't buy, actually. And governments kind of embrace that wherever they can. Can anyone think of another bit of soft power I know the answer, but do you guys in in India that exists um, about Australia? What do people? What is Australia using now really well, apart from cricket and sport, from a soft power perspective? Have a guess. Have a think. You might know. So it's, it's a tough question. It's a very broad question. It's got to do with a TV show. Yeah. Yeah, Master Chef. You're kidding. No. So if you turn on the TV here, I, I guarantee you, I have no proof of this, but I'm sure it's true. More Indians watch MasterChef Australia than Australians. I mean, the numbers would just mean it's true anyway, but um, it's incredible. So we've there's been tours of India of MasterChef Australian judges, contestants. Sarah Todd, I think, was a finalist a while back, has opened a a place in Goa, um, food is being used as a soft power tool by governments. I don't know how successfully they're doing it, but you can yeah. probably say anecdotally that Indians are aware of MasterChef. A certain demographic of Indians are aware of MasterChef Australia and therefore associate Australia with good food um, and things like that, right? Yeah. So it's, and, and do you guys, Gaurav, <coughs> Medha, you agree? You've watched MasterChef? Yeah. Oh, don't, don't be so embarrassed. <laughs> no, it's just, it's big here. And I think part of it is because um, the Indian population or television viewing population love the drama created in MasterChef Australia mm -hmm. and the, as well as the way the food looks. Um, and it's actually, it's quite a well-produced show, blah, blah, blah. But it's, um, relatively speaking, in India, um, so MasterChef India, for example, is not doing as well as MasterChef Australia. So th these are just interesting soft power things that governments can piggyback on that might have just happened by accident because there was some free airtime shown and they put MasterChef Australia on. Um, so these soft power things are fantastic. Tourism is a really important part of, of soft power and you'll see Tourism Australia ads mm -hmm. with food with koalas and kangaroos, with Harbour Bridge, with all sorts of fantastic things about Australia. Um, and this is what I think Indian people will know or think about Australia, which is why we would call it part of the soft power uh, aspect of the bilateral relationship. But these are all things that, that will come up again, um, if not before, then on Friday at the High Commission. And I urge you to ask questions of the diplomats about this, because it's their job to know and embrace this kind of stuff. Um, apart from sort of China and the region and the Indo-Pacific, there's some interesting areas where allies or countries with common interests often align nowadays. And, and that could be sharing of intelligence. It could be um, basically, I mean, there's a, there's a big talk in, in the US about Russian hacking and things like this, right? Whether it's true or not. So, so basically, pooling resources between countries to, to make sure things don't happen, whether it's online or otherwise. So we sometimes look at defense as actual physical 
defense and military but it's certainly not always the case and i'm and, and you can just read on wikipedia or on dfat or on mea ministry of external affairs a big part of the relationship is uh, security defense strategic ties counterintelligence all of these part of things form an important part of the relationship um but i've digressed quite a lot from the legal part of things because I wanted to give you that snapshot mm. of the relationship which feeds into the, to the law side of things anyway because we have seen in recent years exchanges between heads of government so prime ministerial visits um, both ways in 2014 before Prime Minister Modi went to Australia in 2014 an Indian Prime Minister had not been to Australia for 27 years right now let's put that in perspective uh, about 50% of Indian Indians are under the age of 27. So in their lifetime, no Indian PM had been to Australia. So that kind of tells people the insignificance back then of the Australia-India relationship. Yet subsequently, um, we've had a few prime ministerial visits here in the last couple of years, few years. And both PMs since 2014 have met a number of times on the sidelines of, you know, Asia or APEC or whatever kind of international forums. So that is kind of, um, I guess, uh, it shows the, the relative growth of and strength of the relationship, at least even in the last few years since 2014. Um, so there's definitely been a lot of development since I've been here for the last eight years. And, and I think as aspiring international professionals, it's really important to understand that relationship and the importance of India and I hope that you will by the end of these three weeks. Um, I'm happy to stop my my long kind of talk and rant about India and the legal systems but you're welcome to, to ask questions today or otherwise there's going to be kind of an over bloating of knowledge over the course of the next mm. little while so I don't want to give it all away now you've got three weeks of learning to do but any questions otherwise? Yes. Um, yeah, I was going to ask, is there any, do you know of any like, job opportunities or internships that can come? Uh, like, what kind of things are there for law students in Australia? Like, would, would they even want us to work for them in India? Like, what, what can we offer well, that they don't already have? Question. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I guess the same could be said the other way around. And we've just had three Indian students at the Attorney General's office in Canberra. We've got two going to cause. We've got two in a Sydney law firm. Oh. So um, there's demand that way, but we've created that demand. Mm. I think the difference is um, while our centre here is creating opportunities for Indian students, there's no real uh, opposite. Although the Australia India Institute um, is managing Victorian government scholarships for the Mount Monash students at least for internships in India. They're quite competitive, but they are there. Um, and for Murdoch and all other students, you know, you can create opportunities in India. And, and um, whether it's NCP, whether it's self-funded, whatever it is, there are opportunities. And we would be happy to facilitate internships. That's not an issue. Uh, but they can be self-organized. I know people who have <coughs> self-organized clerkships with judges in India, um, internships in firms. Um, when I was... Uh, an associate at or a consultant at this uh, Amachan firm, there were interns from all over the world, not just Australia. So uh, I think some of the big firms, and we can talk about this, you can ask the same question to the firm itself, for example, but there are firms who don't invite applications. They don't have a formal process, but they kind of encourage proactive applicants, mm. if you will. So whereas in Australia, we, we're very strict and regimented in terms of clerkships and openings for internships and things. I think here, it's often largely based on relationships. So do you know anyone in the firm that can do put in a good word? But even without that, I think cold calling a few of the big firms and finding a good partner there and asking for an internship, I think you'll find you know, some firms are quite open to that. So there are certainly opportunities in government, not for the Indian government, but international government organizations, NGOs. There's a couple of good law NGOs like Alternative Law Forum and all sorts here, many of which you'll hear over the course of the next few weeks. Firms, 
um, judges, as I said. So we had an NCP scholar before my time here, not for her um, university part, but she was in part here for her internship, but partly working for a high court judge as a clerk as well. So there is a precedent, for want of a better word, for internships for Australia. And indeed... You're a precedent. Well, yeah, I've, I worked here. And before I sort of worked here, there was not... One could not say, is there demand for Australian lawyers in India? Because, you know, you can't practice here as a foreign qualified lawyer, theoretically. I had to be a consultant and my role was quite limited. But you can create opportunities here. I think more than you can create opportunities in Australia because there's an appeal for international and or internationally qualified lawyers or professionals that maybe there isn't in Australia because we probably don't have enough jobs for even mm. domestic lawyers in Australia, right? So short answer, yes, both for interns and graduates. But I think um, I think you just need to be a bit creative and and start networking and things like that. I. A topic that I said I would talk about, but I didn't I'll just touch on it, is, is foreign law firms in India. The same way that foreign universities aren't allowed in India, there's a, they're expressly prohibited. You can't set up a campus and teach. Foreign law firms cannot set up a firm. Foreign lawyers cannot practice here, except on a fly-in, fly-out basis. Um, as a consequence, there are some kind of best friend relationships and referrals and things, but generally speaking, the big firms in India are big Indian firms. Often they're big Indian family dynasties, big family run firms, although they might be 40 or 50 different partners, some, most not part of the family. Um, or they will be personality driven. So someone might have set the firm up 30 years ago and it's grown into a 300 lawyer firm. But it's not like Australia where you've got a couple of thousand lawyers and hundreds of partners. Um, that level of the business of law is not there. I mean, corporate law in India or corporate law practice in India is probably only 25, 30 years old in the truest sense. Um, until then, what Ajay was referring to, you, you kind of had these um, advocates who were the jack of all trades. They ran their own chambers, if you will, um, and it wasn't really a corporate law firm environment that, as we would see it today. And, and corporate law in India is still evolving as a result because it's relatively young. Um, but because foreign lawyers are restricted here, it does make it a bit more difficult to practice in India. Um, but there's been talk of changing and opening up the legal system. And indeed, if that did happen, um, having this experience, maybe an internship or other things, would certainly um, you know, be well-timed if that does happen if there's it's been there's in fact been some revised rules that have been tabled the prime minister's office is pushing it but this has been tabled many times before so one doesn't know when if and when the legal system will open up to international firms yes that one from an economic perspective yeah I think it's really interesting but I think it's uh, rather than looking at it as a, a big challenge I think it's more of an opportunity because there's no reason why Australia has to tie up or partner with only one of them right so the more international professionals or students who want to study in Australia, probably the better for the education sector, whether they're Indians or Australians or other uh, or Chinese or otherwise, right? But I think um, I think where it becomes really interesting, and this is why if you guys want to browse online for this foreign policy white paper, is where does Australia sort of toe the line from an economic and strategic perspective? Because they've basically come out and said we re we don't rely on China, but we, we have a very strong and important and significant economic relationship with China, but we have to appreciate that strategically our interests are not necessarily aligned with China, but maybe with India and others. So it's a really fine balance that has to be struck when you look at the whole picture. But certainly economically, I don't think Australia should or will try and move all of its eggs in one basket. I think it needs to keep it mixed.
It's interesting. I think you should you should ask this kind of question on Friday to the diplomats as well. But um, there, you know, there's talk about quadrilaterals and trilaterals and all these sorts of things, which increasingly exclude China if you think about it. So, Japan, U.S., Australia, and India, and whereas the kind of the the idea is to to hedge against the growth or strategic and defense growth of a country like China. So. Um, I think it's a fine balance, I think, uh, and there's no easy answer to it. And I'm teach law, so it's not really my question to answer, but it's I, I can make observations on what I read and hear about. But I think it's a really useful question to ask on, on Friday. But I think if you're asking what common ground is, the answer is self-interest. Always like All is. the countries are self-interested, and we have to ask, what can we do for you? What can you do for us? And he's alluded to one of the E's being essentially resources, um, energy. Um, all those three countries have some balance to work out there. Yeah. Any other questions? There'll be plenty of time for questions. We've got lots of long bus trips ahead of us as well. Uh, but I think um, it's time for lunch. So I'll let you guys break for lunch and I'll refer to your programs for your next session, which is 2.30.